it's been very helpful for me to get some sort of framework and understanding of these words that people use. So what's the difference between spirituality and faith and religion and how may I interact with these and how can I work with them in such a way that they actually encourage dialogue at a, at a deep level as opposed to going into conflict and, and going into differences and going into a sense of almost disconnection instead of connection. So what I want to um, can those of you on, uh, I think those of you on Zoom, can you actually see that screen now? Yes. Yes, yes, I can see it. Thank you. Okay, so I will we'll go through into um, looking at really the first one, which is uh, looking at, there's a slide that just come up, which actually is, a for those on the phone, it's a pyramid. And at the bottom, I've got spirituality. The next level, I've got faith. And at the next level, I've got religion. And we'll have a look at those, but it's coming from a sense for me, which you'll see in a second, and actually spirituality, for me anyway, is a sense of, of being inclusive. And I believe everyone has a spirituality. And as we go higher up the pyramid, we then tend to refine it and say, well, do I have faith? Am I related to a certain religion? So Angelo kind of said, well, I have a faith in a higher power, but I'm not affiliated to any particular religion. And there's also a diagram to the left of that, which what I wanted to highlight was, it's from here in the UK. And what's happening in the UK is they did a survey um, in 2011, where they actually found that actually there was 25% of the UK population actually said they had no religion whatsoever. Um, which has grown rapidly since 10 years ago when actually 15% of the population said they've got no religion. Now it's 25%. And I think in the UK now, in latest figures, that that figure is rising. So the sense that Andrew said, you know, there isn't a religion, is a sense that people aren't perhaps directly identifying with either Christian or Muslim or Hindu or Sikh or Buddhist or Jewish. They're just saying, I've got no religion. Um, now I'm just having a look, actually. Let's have a look. Um, we just moved it. The next next one I've got was actually then saying, there's a slide saying actually, what is spirituality? What does spirituality really mean? We're going to have a look at that. One of the definitions that I like, which is from a friend called Andrea Watson, is she, I, I just asked her and she just said to me, David, just as it essence, spirituality is about, is five words for me. It's about falling in love with life, which I particularly liked. And I kind of got that and thought, well, actually, spirituality has a sense that it, it permeates for me all of life. So from my perspective, I've just said, I think everyone has a spirituality and I've called it, it's this you now, you know, wow factor, how I feel alive. It's a kind of driving force behind your life. And we've had a sense of that perhaps through the stories we've heard already on the call. When I did my, my studies on this area, the interesting thing about when you get into the academic side of, okay, what's spirituality? There must be an agreed definition of spirituality. The, the answer is, uh, there isn't an agreed definition of spirituality. I picked out a couple from some of the leading academics in the area, and one says, Mitrov and Denner said, if a single word, one single word captures the meaning of spirituality and the role, the vital role it can play in people's lives, it's interconnectedness. So I think we've already had on the call someone spoken, it was uh, Angelo, about the importance of community, of being connected with others, a sense of connection. And I'm feeling a sense of connection on the call through the story. So, so someone was saying, actually, if it's one word, it might be interconnectedness. Someone else who I know called Lip Swerman, and she's based in New Zealand, now she said for her, spirituality is an ongoing process of finding meaning and purpose in our lives, as well as living out one set of personally held beliefs. And again, if some of the stories we've just shared were around this finding meaning and purpose, being on a journey, looking and examining our own personal beliefs. Uh, and the final one, this one I've got, is actually, it says actually many of the academics, many of the scholars choose not to provide a definition of spirituality because it could then actually try and tie it down into some sort of dogmatic rigidity. And the fact that actually spirituality is meant to tr transcend things, it's almost like it, you, it, once you name it, you lose it, if that makes sense. So in the academic field, which is called issues, there's no agreed definition of spirituality. So... I, I kind of encourage you to look at what yours is. But for mine, and I have one here, the, the definition for me that I use, uh, and it's kind of come out today, is that spirituality is not religion. Which for me, it means it's, spirituality is not about belief, creeds, or dogmas. 
So it's not about that, if it's Christian, and the way of truth and life, no one comes to the Father through me. It's not about those beliefs and creeds or dogmas or signing up to an Nicene Creed or whatever you might sign up to as a religion. But it's about being fully alive. I think Cindy mentioned that. It's about relationships. And it's about that which gives meaning and purpose to our lives. So I think there's, there's a sense of those, those are the threads that run through it for me, and you may have other ones. So it kind of says it's an inner life, so being fully alive. And I think, we, I think it was mentioned that you talked about Angela and other people. It was like, say, I'm in flow. There's a sense that actually everything is, is happening, is unfolding as it should happen. I'm in flow. But actually, particularly if it's a workplace or it can be at home, I'm doing, I'm connected with meaningful work. So I've got a meaning and purpose to my life, this sense of I feel fully alive, but I'm alive for something. And then finally, these things we do normally happen in community because it's the relationships, I believe, that really matter. Um, and just kind of two pictures to finish off this one is I quite often will you play music, I won't today, but Madonna and one of her songs, those talks about, you know, let your body go with the flow, you know, you can do it. It's a very flowing song and that kind of represents part of spirituality for me. And a few people have mentioned nature, so I'm kind of showing a sunset here with a guy that's on a ball, up off a bike with a fabulous sunset by the seaside and the thing says play is good. So for a lot of people it can be going out into nature as a spirituality thing. And one aspect I wanted to bring onto the call is I've worked with those who are atheists that say, no, don't believe in religion, I don't believe in a higher power. But when I speak to them about well, your inner life, you know, what really moves you, what touches you, they will quite often say to me, David, you know what, if I'm by the sea or as a sunset, if I'm out in nature, I get that, that's important to me, that does actually, that flows with me, that's something of real importance to me. And so I've gone back onto the screen with the little triangle diagram, with, so with spirituality at the bottom and then faith and then religion at the top. And I guess I've done a triangle because I kind of see them narrowing almost. So the spirituality at the bottom kind of says, well, the atheist is definitely within here. And I think we'll find in a second, I make an, I make an argument that actually I think the atheist is also in faith, which is, which is, which is quite interesting. So the next one I'm going to look at to move up is kind of faith. And the next slide I show for the people that can see, and I may well play the song. Here in the UK, we've got George Michael, who sadly died recently, but... One of his things, of course, is faith, and I've got to have faith. So this is something, something around that, that the people perhaps are thinking, well, what is faith? And I put up a couple of definitions from faith, from actually two of the main faith traditions, which don't go into dogma and, and rites and stuff. But they do speak about God. So the first one, actually, is, is one from the Christian Bible, Hebrews 11.1. 1, and it says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, for the conviction of things not seen. So I think when we're moving into the realms of faith, there's something about, actually, I can't give you at this moment a hard-nosed, perhaps, proof of saying that it's here. I can't prove from a, perhaps, a monotheic proposition that God exists, but there's an assurance, there's a conviction, there's a hope of things not seen. And I've also put on screen that for the Muslims, what they call shahada is a declaration of faith and a trust that says there's no God but God, and Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of God. So there's a sense for them that actually, you know, God and, and Muhammad, peace be upon him, that, that, that's kind of the initial sense of, like, here's, our, here's our faith, our hope, and our trust is we place things in, kind of almost at this top level. And what I wanted to say is, particularly when you're looking across, and um, we'll come on to religions in a second, but if you're looking, let's say, Muslims and Christians, moving kind of Muhammad and Jesus to one side, if you like, this fact that actually that there's an understanding of the being a single God is something that can be very and actually have, you can have great discussions so one very quick embodied example I want to give you which was a deep beautiful encounter is that I was actually on and I spoke with Cindy and Bill about this was on a place called Holy Island which is in England and I was on retreat and it is a true story I went to the church in the morning as I came out of the church in the morning a woman came up to me and she said you're an interfaith minister I said yes I am she said, I'm here with a group of Muslim women and a group of Christian women. Would you come and speak to us this evening? Because um, we'd love you to come and, and, and hold the space for us as both Muslims and also as Christians. So I agreed to do that. And I, had a, and I said yes. And then I thought, oh my goodness, what am I going to speak about? Because one of the fears that came up for me, which we're going to speak about, 
the last thing I want to do is cause division among these two groups of women, a group of Christian women, a group of Muslim women. What can I actually do? So what I did, interestingly enough, and this is how you can find links to actually link people together. And the story was, was amazing. And it's one of those things, almost Angela, you spoke about being in flow. I was kind of at a flow moment, and I just kind of thought, do you know what? The five pillars of Islam, in general terms that they talk about, those can be reflected in the Celtic saints. So without going into great detail, it's quite a long story. What I did then is I then talked about the five pillars of Islam very briefly. And I spoke about for the Celtic Christian saints, for Christianity, how they actually operated on those five pillars of prayer, charity, fasting, pilgrimage, and this, this, this declaration of faith. What that mean, meant for the Celtic Christians, because there were similarities. There was their own examples. They were different, but there was a flow with them. There was a connection with them. So I said all of this. And then the room, I'm not joking, the room went quiet. And I was wondering, oh my goodness, have I said the wrong thing? What's going to happen? And then a very wise Muslim woman stood up and she said, David, I want to thank you so much. We've been wondering how we can introduce the five pillars of Islam with our Christian friends. And the way you've linked that together is just so beautiful. Thank you so much. And then what happened was, at this kind of spiritual level, there was a tremendous sharing about how through the beauties of nature in the island, the island had spoken to them of Christianity, had spoken to them of the Quran and their Muslim faith. And there were deep sharings about how they'd opened up to this sense of flow within their faith. And I know that the woman that invited me to the group just looked at me and had a big beaming smile on her face. There was a deep connection that happened that, that evening between those, those women. And I kind of got out of the way, if you like, it just then flowed. So I think if you're having deep dialogue, look for where you can find those, those connections. There's almost a sense of what I call there was a unity through the diversity almost. Yes, there's different ways of looking things, but at this level you could find those connections. If you can find those connections, you have a conversation that's really very powerful. Mm -hmm. um, so what I wanted to then say is actually, as far as faith is concerned, we heard it from the Christian faith, I think one thing that comes through in different languages, different traditions, is this aspect of hope. What is faith about? Faith, in some extent, is I think. And again, looking at a, at a definition I've got, it's almost kind of saying that faith is trusting in and believing with all your heart in some sort of greater source, greater love. It could be Buddha nature, etc. That even when times are bad and there's no scientific proof that you're right, it's an instinctive feeling that there's something there of hope. And as it says, you don't need a religion to feel faith, which is interesting, because the religion, then, as we'll see in a second, is all the bits that go around this. And I think this is where the atheists come in. I think the faith framework is really, at its essence, says, when things get, when things get hard, this is what I trust in, this is what I believe will get me through to the next stage of life. It's almost like a route map. So I can argue, I think, atheists, I would ask them the question, what's your route map through life? How, what do you put your hope in, your faith in? They may even say themselves, but you've got an angle there for actually to keep them in the conversation and keep having a conversation. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that is, that is important. Um, and the last, last area I wanted to move on to with the triangles is the top of the triangle. So I've looked at spirituality, which I think flows through all. We looked at faith, which is linked into hope. And then we look at the top one, religion. Uh, and we've already had him mentioned today, actually. So I'm bringing up a picture of Eckhart Tolle. And his quote says, although at the heart of every religion there lies an essential truth, what he calls the jewel in the lotus, religion itself is not the truth, but it's a story woven around the truth, which I think is, is, is very uh, interesting. And as I, put, I just put a picture of two antelopes going head to head and clashing antlers or not, and saying, actually, I think religion is the level where most of the disputes occur. Mm -hmm because people can get stuck in certain dogmas, creeds, beliefs, then get stuck even in a certain period or culture or set of values or patriarchal things, which actually a story probably woven around the truth. And that's, that's a difficult, that, so that's, that's the angle for me. And quite often, I think when we talk about interfaith conversation, we can quite often start, if we're not careful, going in at these dogmas. And my sense is when that happens, you can get a clash. So, as I said, there's ways out of it, but I think there are better ways of looking at it. Um, and finally, about religion. What does religion mean? Well, for me, actually, I've got here, religion is a group 
So it could be a Christian group, might be a Christian denomination, a Hindu you know, group, a group whose idea and beliefs in your spirituality and faith match your own and you have a willingness to live within these beliefs. Mm. So I've said that actually people, you may not agree with all of the inverted commas qualifying conditions, but in order to belong and be part of this religion, you're likely to support enough of the key conditions that you feel authentic and actually staying and you don't put your personal integrity at risk. So in my experience, when you're part of the religion, it kind of says, this is the way we see our spirituality and our faith being expressed. For me, let's say for Methodists, you want to be part of this Methodist church, we do things this sort of way. And this is how we see God, this is, how we, this is how we see our faith being lived out. And for example, everyone's welcome to communion is one of the beliefs that sits within the Methodist, which wouldn't sit in a Catholic or in UK here in Anglican perspective. So but you get down there to the nitty gritty of well, what, what's important to me, what do I believe? And you can quite often then fall out over those areas is, is, my, is my understanding and my, my perspective. Um, so when I've done, and it's interesting, when I've done interfaith work, so I was part of here in the UK, the Birmingham West Midlands Faith Forum, we tended to find that actually the conversations would stay around that level of kind of faith, that understanding of a higher power, and then we'd share from that perspective. In my experience, when we had more evangelical Christians that came and said, we're going to convert all the others to Christianity, they probably lasted one meeting and didn't come back again. <laughs> because the, 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 the sharing was kind of at this level of kind of spirituality and faith level. And, and it did get some good understanding. We got some excellent bonding that was there. But I think when we move, particularly in the Christian ones, to the more evangelical, it can be a harder space to move into because they're looking to say, this is the truth as opposed to a story around the truth. Well, I'm, I'm going to share something that actually has been a game changer in, in a couple of conversations for me. So almost before I just close. And it came from a Hindu teacher, actually. We shared this story. It could have come from any of the faiths. And I'll cut down the story. So brief the story is this. There were two young boys who were playing, as young boys do, in a park. And they were playing happily. And then one of the boys said... I've got the greatest mom in the world. And the other boy said, no, I've got the greatest mom in the world. And as boys do, they started fighting. And as they started fighting, this very wise sage came along. And he said, what are you fighting over? And they explained this one boy said, I've got the greatest mom in the world. And he said, no, I've got the greatest mom. And so he just gently parted them. And he turned to the one boy. He said, I just want you to follow some words and say something for me, to me. So he said to this one boy, he said, what I want you to say is this. And he said, I've got the greatest mom in the world for me. <laughs> so this boy said, I've got the greatest mom in the world for me. He turned to the other boy and said, can you say the same? So I've got the greatest mom in the world for me. And then the boys went off happily and played. <laughs> and the story of this teacher was that when we get into these di deep dialogues and we get into points of trouble, bring it back for me and to recognize what other people are saying and honor mm -hmm. that and to own it for themselves as being true for them in that moment. And, and I've, I've had a very deep discussion with an evangelical Christian and it totally, it brought us together, that, that dialogue did. We were at Hamhags, sharing that with him totally changed the way we looked at each other and what we were doing. So that's, that, that was very powerful. And just to kind of that's close with, it, it, it was, it, was, yes. it stayed with me for, for, for quite a number of years. So thank you. Yeah, um, well. So as I share, really, and I think someone's already mentioned this, when I were doing all this work, I picked up a, a quote from Martin Luther King from his Nobel Peace Prize speech in 64. And it's kind of, in all this work, we see love as a unifying, uniting force. So, so I'll read from his speech. He says, when I speak of love, I'm not speaking of some sentimental and weak response, which is little more than emotional bosh. He says, when I'm speaking of love, I'm speaking of that force which all of the great religions have seen as the supreme unifying principle of life. Love is somehow the key that unlocks the door which leads to ultimate reality. This is a Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist belief about ultimate reality. Therefore, the first hope in our inventory must be that hope, the hope that love is going to have mm. the last word. And I actually think my, my sense and my real embodied understanding is once we, once we grasp this, my final slide on this one, is actually when we, it then turns the whole thing on its head for that love, it then becomes about radical inclusion of all, all once you really grasp this. Mm -hmm. 
So we're all at different stages, but I hope this, this conversation has given you, you know, a few insights. We've had some great sharings about how you can take this into your homes, your communities, your work life, your daily lives, and have some great conversations. Because what I wanted to say is, from my experience, they're certainly worth the while and, and they're worth taking part in. So, so thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, this has been wonderful. Really great.